I would like to start with two quotes from my recent LinkedIn posts. Um, the first one is from yesterday, where I was surprised to see that a representative of the international cocoa trader Mondelez said, no one company can solve the issues of the cocoa supply chain alone. Well, I think this is exactly our topic today. And she continued to say that's why Mondelez is joining Mars Wiley, Barry Calbo and other companies in a call for the EU to implement mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence. And I remember one more quote in October saying that Germany is at the forefront as a driver of change in the cocoa sector, referring to our GISCO initiative, of which we will hear more in this webinar. I think these quotes are quite encouraging, um, sound quite well, and it looks like the cocoa companies really aim for a change and that there is an important role to play for multi-stakeholder partnerships. I'm going as far to say this is not achievable with private or government funds alone, but we have to walk together. And I think um, uh, the BMZ reference framework shows the red frame, basically, in which uh, the BMZ is ready to do that or is doing that already um, in the agricultural and food sector. Uh, the reference framework is not only needed to guide our programs and implementation, but it's also needed as a sign to all those who are critical towards uh, working together with other actors than governments. The Evaluation Institute Deval uh, looked at this because there is a lot of critique always towards uh, partnering with non-governmental actors. Luckily, the conclusion was yes. Uh, cooperation uh, is contributing significantly to achieving development goals such as poverty reduction or food secu security. At the same time, there are a few recommendations uh, that were held, uh, 17 uh, recommendations for uh, the BMZ at different referees within the BMZ. Um, but the biggest one, I would say, or the one that is mostly most shared uh, by critical NGOs is the compliance with environmental, social, and human rights standards. Uh, this is a prerequisite for positive development. Uh, BMZ has revised the reference framework for development partnerships in the agri-food sector to ex more explicitly include a section on human rights. And in the discussions, we were able uh, to show that it is not important to show which actor created which impact, but that the, the collaboration created impact. This is another glance on the reference framework. You see there, are, there were 10 criteria, with the 11th being newly explicitly mentioned, which is human rights. Important is that these criteria are binding for all projects under this framework, so for all uh, projects that work in partnership with the private sector and multi-stakeholder partnerships, of course, as well. These are all the different tools that we have for cooperating with the private sector. And interesting enough, uh, uh, the BMZ has forgotten what we talk about, and which is one of the uh, largest used tools, the multi-stakeholder partnerships. I would now like to ask Sonja Lehmann to take over. You can introduce us to GISCO. The objectives of, of uh, this platform is to, um, to improve living condition of cocoa farmers, mainly in West Africa, uh, make a, a positive contribution to natural resources conservation and increase the share of sustainable cocoa in the German market. GISCO also offers different um, information services to its members. It works in uh, different working groups and it also has um, a joint project, development project in Cote d'Ivoire um, that works with about 20,000 farmers. What are the key expectations of the global industry and traders for the promotion of the cocoa value chain? At first it was all um, focused on certification if uh, cocoa was certified, it was sustainable, but that has proven to be uh, more complex than, um, than that. These farmers, they receive uh, 75 cents 
uh, of a dollar per day. And if you compare that at, uh, to the poverty line of um, 90 cents, they don't even reach that. And if you benchmark it to the living income uh, value, which is of 2.17, then uh, farmers don't even make a third uh, of, of this um, value. So uh, poverty is a big problem among uh, cocoa producers. Then we have um, other questions for the inputs we've just heard. One um, is, uh, how do you manage the power relations between smaller and larger partners? Sonia, do you have some experience there from Cisco? Of course, we have big, very big companies and we have uh, the smaller ones. We have ones that are like more powerful than others. We work on one-to-one -one relations. Every, every member can uh, participate in the discussion, um, take part of the working group and, and contribute as much as he feels to. Um, what we try is to keep a balance um, of participation and power within the four uh, member groups, um, government, industry, retail and so, uh, civil society. Um, but we have not had these cases where big companies face the smaller ones. Zilke, anything to add there from your side? From a former experience I had, where especially this question of power relations was really crucial, since uh, there was a setting where producer organizations and trader organizations were both in, in the board. And naturally there is a dependency between producers and traders. Um, and this was, I would say, one of the main obstacles in decision finding, um, since uh, yeah, producers didn't really or that couldn't couldn't really express their voice, <laughs> since they were just afraid of losing trade contracts. So we have to, I think, in multi-stakeholder settings, we have to be very. Um, yeah, aware of the power relations that are just given by by global um, by by global value chains um, and the dependency between the actors. Um, the weaker partners, the weaker actors, do not express themselves like they should in such multi-stakeholder platform. However, on the other side, I think the platform gives them a unique opportunity to express themselves at the same level. It's at least an opportunity where they meet with their clients um, and where they can discuss outside of their immediate business uh, and uh, develop maybe better relations, develop another communication, despite all these difficulties. It is um, a task of, of those um, sitting in the secretary or doing the process design to take that into consideration. There are ways to open up the information, to make it transparent, but also to protect some of the, yeah. the sources of, of some uh, points of view or recommendations. So it is, it has to be considered when uh, making the design of some kind of strategic or decision yeah. process. Yes, that's true. One question uh, that came to mind is also regarding GISCO, which is a very large initiative. How do you rate the opportunities for impact vis-a-vis -vis the time that you lose due to negotiations between the different actors and their different interests? Yes, uh, time is... is actually a success factor for any kind of, of strategic process within a, a platform. We um, made this, this discussion process around the new uh, objectives and the new strategy and had one year for that. We had more than 15 meetings and, and sittings and calls from the different working groups on that. And we had to prepare information, prepare, um, uh, talk to the to the different stakeholders uh, in between times, and and uh, provide uh, um, a lot a lot of specialized information and and process support. So it was a very short amount of time, but we we within GI said we knew if we don't make it in that time, we will lose. Um, the motivation and the interest of participant and it also it can even get to that point that a platform falls apart. This is 
a very critical factor. And right now we are entering in a second critical factor when negotiating, because now we have a vision, now we know where we want to go, and now we are all set up and ready to start. So we again have to be like one step ahead and be faster and be able to provide concepts and solution to the different stakeholders. So government comes and says, okay, what should I do? Should I, should I make a statement? I want to do it tomorrow. So you have it, you have to have it, you have to have recommendations for that. Um, private sector comes and says, okay, I want to deliver an income. How do I do it? Can you help me? Who can help me? Who can support that? Who can develop a concept for that? So it is again time. And if you are not fast enough, um, Yes, you you lose possibility to reach some kind of results. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in that question of, of Sara, Lena, I, I, I also uh, see that what about the different interests of actors? And um, our learning is we have to work on the common vision, on the uh, parts of the objective that has been agreed among the stakeholders and not on that on which we disagree. It's not a good starting point. So yeah. first on the common agreed topics and then slowly take in the ones that are not familiar or are in the interest of everybody. I was surprised by uh, Sonia's presentation saying that we need much more communication. We need to help them to harmonize the objectives, bringing them together, creating linkages between the stakeholders where I thought, well, but they are all in the same business. So um, there should be linkages. They should have the same objectives. Why is this still, why are they so far? And um, I think in a discussion that we had before the webinar, Sonia said, um, in, in short, uh, in Africa, they are still talking about how to get organized into cooperatives. And here we talk about the complex issues of sustainability uh, and deforestation. And they are worlds apart in terms of what they are discussing and have no same idea about the development of their value chain. I was just wondering uh, what our strategy for the cocoa value chain is. I mean, we talk about smallholders who cannot make a living on producing the raw material. And of course, uh, the living wage or a living income concept is of help here. But I simply wonder uh, whether it is possible to make a decent living just by producing uh, a raw commodity. Uh, the money is made in other stages of the value chain, in particular in cocoa. Now we have a platform in which uh, the different stages of the value chain are present. Uh, is there any chance of getting beyond the primary stage as being our focus of attention? Uh, I assume that if you want to really get ahead in economic growth and income, you have to look at other stages of the value chain and bring investment to the countries uh, beyond uh, the raw material primary production. This is a question. I don't know whether this is possible, but maybe you have something to say on, on, on that one. I would like to hand this question over to Silke if you want to answer that, because from my point of view, I think really there is a chance when you have the sectoral approach uh, combined with a regional approach. Where you have, uh, where you not only take into account the natural resources of the area, but also all the actors that are in the area. So, do you want to um, answer that question or give us your opinion yeah. on that?
companies is completely different of our thinking <laughs> and and um so this is as well one of the of the big challenges i think um that uh, to to really convince a private sector company to invest resources and energy in a value addition in the region directly is a way to go and needs yeah needs a very very holistic and and maybe a patient approach uh, since the since the benefit for the private sector country is not at first sight evident and uh, this is part of this learning together and going this this journey together um, especially in the cocoa value chain it has been uh, debated uh, how much value addition is possible within producing countries such as Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. And in fact, uh, our minister uh, has been very outspoken and wants much more value addition within those countries. Okay. Before we simply said, oh, this is not possible or not so well possible. And this has partly technical reasons. Like, for example, um, if you produce within Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire, the temperatures are higher. You cannot leave the, the chocolate simply on the shelf. It would melt. Thus, you need different types of oil going with it, palm oil, uh, and they don't taste so well. So it ha there are some technical problems, but with the new uh, or the, the, the country package of the Sevo uh, Innovation Center, Cote d'Ivoire, has explicit the mandate to push value addition within the country. The second point is, I have seen, I was in August in Madagascar, and I noticed there were a lot of very good um, chocolates uh, that had real export uh, quality and i think most likely this is also possible for for other countries uh, in west africa or elsewhere in the world in two uh, directions number one producing for the own consumer market and secondly for the export market but uh, uh, and i suspect that in the past um, uh, there were big interests to to sort of get the uh, bigger part of the value addition outside uh, the producing countries with the argument that the producing countries do not meet the the taste qualities that consumers in a particular country like France as a uh, the consumers ask for much more dark chocolates than Germany, etc. Uh, but I, I think despite maybe valid reasons, there is a big scope of doing indeed more on value addition. I think there are quite a number of initiatives like the French company Semois in Côte d'Ivoire, who I think two years ago started chocolate production. Um, Ecuador got a prize at the chocolate fair in London for its high quality chocolate. Um, Anne-Marie Mattes always gave me nice Ghanaian chocolate when I was in Ghana. And Eberhard, when you say there's also potential for export, I would say there's particularly a potential for regional export, maybe not so much for chocolate export in the short run to Germany or France, but in the region for um, the regional market in neighboring countries, I would see quite some potential there. I mean, Ecuador is a very good um, example of, of farmers working on adding value to cocoa, uh, processing it up to, to different chocolate uh, products and, and offering them in the international markets. You have plenty of experiences in Ecuador around that. And it is true, it has helped farmers to increase their income. But it is not a solution for a big part of the farmers. It's always reduced to a small amount, to small niche markets, so you cannot use it as a change strategy for the whole value chain. Don't forget about 50% of the cocoa produced in Cote d'Ivoire is processed there in Cote d'Ivoire and 
exported as a processed product, butter or powder or whatever. And they, what they, they have only managed to create a small amount of, of jobs for, for, for Ivorian people. The, the structure of the cocoa um, value chain is, um, I mean, it it is concentrated when coming up to industrialization of cocoa to only like five companies worldwide. So it is very difficult to try to to pull back these these steps of 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 addition of value of the value chain down to the farmers, and to have a wide impact. On other commodities, it, it is possible that it works, but I think in cocoa it is pretty difficult. I see also more comments here from Arne Schuffenhauer, for instance, uh, um, who says that he sees uh, the potential that there are chocolates that are marketed in Europe and Africa at the same time and must not be the chocolate uh, just for to be produced in Africa. Um, but concluding with Sonja, maybe the um, it's a small percentage that um, can really be uh, transformed within the country and uh, still the, the, the largest part is the export of the raw material. But um, I would not like to get too much into chocolate now. I think our topic is not so much chocolate today. Our topic is more um, how these multi-stakeholder platforms work and what they can do. And chocolate, Gisco, we just take as an example. Um, there was one other question from Claudius Bredeft. How is the public sector involved in platforms like Gisco? Trade requirements, regulations and tariffs have quite an impact on the global value chain. Until now we have had the participation of, of the German Development Ministry and also uh, of the Food and Agricultural Ministry. But the uh, quests or, or the topics that Claudius is addressing, trade requirements, regulation, tariffs, they go uh, sometimes beyond these two ministries. And this is right now where uh, the discussion and the trends are going to. Um, we are talking about possible regulations for for um, the implementation of human rights within the the value chain, and uh, that is something that possibly is not even only a thing of the ministries in Germany, but also a, a subject of discussion within um, within the governments at EU level at EU level. So um, I think the role and uh, the activities of the the governments are, or the expectation towards governments are changing right now, and we have to be um, in the in, in the capacity of supporting these these new roles they are taking. In. Yes. And try to to get these other parts of the governments into um, the negotiation. I mean, uh, we cannot expect everybody to join the platform, but bring them together and uh, link the discussion also with the other ministries or the other governments in in other regions. Yes. In that regard, maybe uh, two more questions there. One from Pascal. How important are personalities and skills to manage the relations? In other words, is there enough training in that regard to uh, develop personalities and um, skills to, to manage relations? Number one. And number two, um, I'm wondering also in this um, regard of uh, how is the public sector involved in the platform? GIZ is doing the secretariat of GISCO. Um, but on the other side, is that really the best way? Shouldn't it be a secretariat that is done, run by the industry itself? Um, on one side, I see the advantage. Sonia, you said, okay, we can facilitate, we are an outsider, we are neutral. Um, yeah, but on the other side, um, I wonder whether the ownership of the industry um, is really there. Mm -hmm. uh, well, when when um, I would start with the last question about um, um, ownership, I mean, Agisco is an initiative that is um, since I think more than five years now uh, financed uh, mostly by their members. I mean, 
uh, the, the private members, civil society, and also, of course, um, government have uh, pay a membership fee and finance uh, the activities of the secretary. And every two years, uh, the the board, uh, no, excuse me, the, the, the general assembly decide whether the secretary should be um, continued uh, by GIZ or not. And sometimes the discussions are tough. I mean, they consider different issues. Uh, is GIZ uh, too costly? Are they bringing the results? And they are really a hard judge when, when, when evaluating what kind of, of results we have reached or not. And I think that, uh, I mean, um, I would say we are kind of successful, but also not always. Not everything uh, that the secretary does works. Um, but but I think until now, our uh, the members of JESCO are behind the secretary um, carried out by JESCO. The whole value chain is more than cocoa. There are other companies um, producing sugar, fats, and so on, um, using cocoa one way or the other. So it's not chocolate producers, it's not cocoa producers. Um, it's more multi-stakeholder partnerships. How would you see that? Um, what kind of actors do we need to bring together? If you are very conservative, then you have the cocoa value chain and the chocolate value chain. Um, but still, you have like the actors at first that are within the um, each each step. Then you can include service providers and uh, government and. Um, if you are talking about uh, social issues then or, or sustainability issues, then you can also include academia and 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 civil society. We have to be aware that that all products are really um, or mostly are made out of more commodities than just one. And uh, taking the example of Tony, Tony Chocoloni. They told me as well, everybody's focusing on the cocoa within our chocolate, but nobody asked for the sugar. Mm. And we need to, we need to think out of those islands, um, or out of those silos in a way, in just focusing on, on just one commodity, but we have to think more on the, yeah, in, in more in the systematic way. And I still think that this is, um, uh, an exercise we have to do. <laughs> so a final product is always um, made of different, or mostly made of different raw materials that come from different supply chains, from different channels that um, also may have different issues how different suppliers get organized. And uh, I think they are that's why it's, it's good with um, how Value Links also sees the value chain development. Uh, Andreas always points out to scoping. We can define it in a very narrow way or we can define it in a broader way. Uh, and then we include the different um, ingredients of a final product, for instance, or can point out to different final products from um, a commodity-based value chain that turns into different end uses. You have to be uh, clear what, about what the objective is. Is uh, the objective to support some farmers in some region? Then you have a, a product approach and go through the cocoa uh, value chain. And that's it. If uh, you want to provide sustainability um, in Germany, then you may have to work with a retailer based or a cross uh, sectoral uh, platform. If you want to have a sustainable product in your hand, a sustainable chocolate, then you have to work with something that offers solutions not only for the cocoa, but also for the sugar, the butter, the I don't know, whatever you have inside that product. So I think um, it has to be very, very clear where you are putting uh, the, the objective of the work of this uh, platform you are creating. 
it's not completely right, Sonia, to be honest, since um, if we see from the producer side, so for example, if we have the, the challenge of avoiding deforestation, maybe if we just focus on cocoa, we reach to avoid deforestation in cocoa, but then the deforestation takes place in the same region because of rubber or what, whatsoever. So um, it's not only the question if, for, if it's interesting for us as consumers, but it's also the question question if it really makes a change in the region and to have um, to look why does deforestation take place and not to look in the de in the commodity itself mm. yes you, you're right I mean it is um, that that's the point at the end of the day where do you want to to reach the the, the result or the the impact right? On, I see clearly the difference in the approach when you talk so about cross commodity approaches and uh, you have the landscape approach and see what's going on there. But on the other side also, when uh, Sonia talked about diversification and when I see how important meanwhile also diversification is for cocoa companies, it's not the same diversification or cross commodity approach, but at least it goes into um, a similar direction. Uh, that um, it's, it's not anymore just the one value chain approach. Uh, but that we see more the you know, the uh, farming system that is there, um, that we see different possibilities, the combination of income uh, that is there, and um, a cross commodity approach, of course, is much more open than if we start from a value chain perspective. But still, diversification and cross commodity um, has at least some similarity. Yes, specifically for diversification, is where you need like a cross commodity approach because it is it will be at the start it will be okay cocoa companies will be able to uh, invest in activities towards uh, diversification but at some point they will say my my job my my um, profit is in cocoa and not in maize or not in uh, in rice or other <laughs> so then you really need to open up and bring uh, in the, the the other commodities in your platform Yes. And then you get to a cross-sectoral platform at some point. Is there any experience of multi-stakeholder platforms elaborating legislative proposals as a basis? In our case, not yet. Not <laughs> so okay. we we had we exist since one year only, and uh, but I think it could go in this direction. Okay, and Eberhard Krein has an example. I have an example for uh, a regulatory and tax paying uh, thing. <laughs> um, we managed with our uh, Malawi uh, tea uh, initiative to get uh, wages for tea workers higher. And then the tea workers got <laughs> into a new tax bracket. So because their, their wage increased, they had to pay much more tax. So they lost quite a lot of the wage increase through the new tax bracket. And um, within, our, within the total initiative, this, uh, this matter was very much debated uh, and also investigated. And then um, uh, one of our partners, the Tea Association of Malawi, went to the government, to the Ministry of Finance, and lobbied uh, very hard to get uh, the, the, the tax brackets in total uh, much higher so that uh, tea workers again went out of the tax bracket. So. Uh, Maybe this is an example for a platform that is not here in Europe, but uh, that had been created in Malawi. Also, our other resource person, Sarah Lena, Silke, Sonja, maybe some final statements? So I found it very, very interesting to hear this. And um, as much as we always ask, uh, the NGOs to be more open-minded when it comes to, you know, opening up to big businesses. I think we also have to look at uh, more thinking more out outside the box as we are already doing even to see uh, a bit 
what I was hinting at with my question was not only about commodities, it was also about which kind of partners do we want to collaborate in, yes? Uh, can, can it not be the big ones because they have a larger scale, even though they might be critiqued by some sections of uh, uh, the, the public here in Germany? Silke or Sonja? Well, just to thank you very much for the discussion today. My side as well. And I, I think as Sara already said, we should continue in a way. <laughs> so there, there is still a way to go. And um, I, I think the great thing is to really learn from all the steps we do. And naturally there are sometimes maybe mistakes or there are sometimes just we, we took the wrong, the wrong corner, but um, this is, this is our, this is what we do. <laughs> for me, it was super interesting to see what kind of communication gaps are still there between the market and the suppliers. Like uh, Sonia said, uh, we have to bring them together, we have to harmonize the objectives, where before I was thinking this is more or less logical, that should work. And, um, and I think there also when we do planning of value chain projects and value chain development strategies, I think we have to ensure much more that we really include more the international perspective the international partners when we are working in the countries that we get this um, input in a stronger way and also I think in future we should discuss a little bit more still um, the landscape approach and also to what extent the landscape approach and value chain promotion fit together well um, where are they going into the same direction and where are they different from each other, because it's just another uh, starting point uh, that has been chosen. Uh, and, um, and, and also the point how to organize the multi-stakeholder platforms best. I think that was also a very interesting part um, of our discussion. More closed, more open, whom to bring in, um, how to organize it, um, how to set it up. Um, that was very helpful from my side. I really uh, have in mind now that there is multi-stakeholder partnerships are one instrument of many to cooperate with the private sector, which we all agree on is very important, just to sum up a bit of what we've heard today. And the special thing about multi-stakeholder partnerships is that they are not all the same. They have much opportunity um, to really uh, identify the common vision and the common goals, which is very important, I think, and needs a lot of effort um, to uh, communicate on that and to be very transparent about interests and um, to harmonize them and that you, are, you have... Um, mutual trust and respect for one another and for all the different stakeholders with their strengths and weaknesses, of course. So with that, I would like to end it today. I hope it was a pleasure for you as well and see you next time. It's going to be the 8th of January on living income and living wedges.